All right, testing, testing. Hello. Can everyone hear me okay? All the way in the back. Woohoo! All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming in today on a lovely Wednesday. Um, today, we are actually piloting a very fun tech talk today. So if you haven't heard of tech talks, these are geared for our community, so wide open events. Um, today, specifically, we're going to be focusing on growth and through fractional officers. So I say this because I want to mentioned that there will be a survey that we send out, and I would love to hear your responses. Um, like I said, we're piloting this initiative. The idea comes from my colleague who's actually on maternity leave, so I'll give Jessica Prath all the credit she deserves, but she wants to create a fractional vetted list of fractional officers for our growth stage communities so that we can introduce people that are helpful to activate um, and just, you know, scale sustainably for our companies here before it's you know the biggest fire that's that's happening in in their minds um, but with that my name is Aranza I am the director of our early stage program I also help oversee how our early stage founders transfer into our growth stage membership and our mission here at 1871 is to equip inspire and support our founders so we serve the full maturity curve today is really focused on that growth stage founder what is the inflection point that you need to get over for activated growth and scale um, and I have a very exciting panel to introduce so I'm actually gonna hand the mic over to Will Smith who's a mentor here at 1871 and has helped put this awesome event together so hands together for Will <laughs> thank you thank you Aransa Thank you guys for coming to this uh, very special panel. Um, I'm esteemed with some very great guests that are from various walks of life, right? And um, I'll let them come up here and introduce themselves, but um, give a round of applause for them, please. And watch your step, too. There's no like little thing. This is, I gotta get up there. Okay, so thank you all for coming out here today. Um, this is the fractional leadership panel where we are going to cover uh, leadership and fractionals and um, pretty familiar that everyone knows what those are, but I wanted to give a chance to uh, the panelists to give a uh, talk about what they do, um, some of the industries that they work in, and maybe a fun fact. So Erica, start off. You gotta call me first. <laughs> um, hi everyone, my name's Erica Naram. I'm with Founders Law. Um, we at Founders Law, we're based here in Chicago. Um, we really are focused on everything a founder might need from formation through about Series C. Why we hyper-specialize is we found that from these larger law firms, sometimes those micro uh, specialist needs of an early, early stage founder aren't being met by larger law firms, and if they are, they're being met at three times the price. And so we really wanted to hyper-specialize and really focus on those early stage companies. But what we're gonna talk about today is what happens when you start to grow. Um, most people think that you have to hire a uh, chief legal officer, and our contention is that you don't. We can actually service um, most companies as a fractional uh, GC, all the way up through about Series C, um, and we act as a quarterback, and basically plug and play any specialty uh, legal teams that you might need, employment when you get to uh, sort of a stage of hiring or tax uh, attorneys. We actually have a large community of attorneys that we work closely with, and we find who you need specifically, and then we QB that relationship. And what that essentially means is that we will um, take what your needs are, distill them to the most um, specific questions, and so we reduce that higher end legal cost down because we are actually brokering that relationship and know how to structure those questions. So at the end of the day, we want to give you everything that you need and nothing that you don't. Love it, love it. Yeah, there. Hi, my name is Heather Twasson. I'm the founder and CEO of Arena. We offer fractional CFO and accounting services to businesses under 40 million in annual revenue, regardless of your stage. 
Uh, and one reason why we formed the company is because oftentimes it's the owner of the business that is uh, managing the finances, putting the projections together for that fundraise, et cetera. And we offer a pretty qualified CFO to face off with you that can sit in your investor meetings, that can show you your statistics month over month from a key performance indicator perspective. Uh, and, and it's done at a fraction of the cost. I find oftentimes I spent my career um, as a leader in, um, in organizations and oftentimes a leader is actually not giving you that high value work 100% of the time. How much time are they spending on scheduling, on this and that and the other? And that is what you get rid of when you um, hire a fractional um, officer in your organization. You're getting that high caliber expertise um, without having to pay for their full-time salary, uh, which is some of the times it's just the administrative work. Uh, so the other advantage of a fractional is you get the expertise of all the fractionals on that team. So just like you were mentioning in the legal space, in the, in the finance space, if there is a finance challenge that you're facing uh, that another CFO on the team at Arena has uh, tackled before, they will jump in and support. So you get kind of collective minds together. Uh, so that is, uh, that's the basis of Arena. We've been around for five years. We just hit our anniversary last week. And we serve businesses all over the country, up to 40 million. Spectacular. Kajal. Hi, everyone. I'm Kajal Jane. I am a fractional strategist. My expertise are product and go-to-market. I actually have my own practice called Habit. And my goal at Habit is to make sure that your customer becomes a habit of your product or service. I typically focus on the tech side of things, specifically B2B, and I cover all industries, um, making sure, scaling them and growing them in, in all growth phases. Thank you. Hi, I'm Yvette Kennedy. Um, I am a fractional HR officer. I have spent the majority of my career in large and small organizations serving as either chief people officer or HR leader, and about two and a half years ago, Oh, I thought something happened. About two and a half years ago, I established Kennedy Talent Strategies. I work with leaders of all sizes and different stages in their um, growth, uh, specifically for, for entrepreneurs that are just starting their business. I would work with them in terms of, you know, do you want to hire employees? Where is the market for that? What's that going to, um, what, what type of investment does that need to be? Um, coaching other executives to come on board is something that I do as well. I also work on, with large-scale transformation, so merger and acquisition activity, working with C, the C-suite in terms of how does that talent align to their business objectives and how do we activate um, talent to for future objectives as well. So I work kind of the gamut between large and small. Um, the benefit to a CHRO fractional um, executive is that, again, you're not, I think we've all echoed that, you're not paying um, you know, a full-time salary, but you're getting what you need in terms of advice. I also work with CHROs at companies because CHROs need advice and counsel too. They're really kind of sometimes married and you know, mirrored down in their operational and process work. And um, I serve as a second seat helping them be a little more innovative and creative, especially if the business is changing. So I'm located here in Chicago, and um, that's it. That's all about me. Fantastic, fantastic. And I guess I'll talk about myself. So my name is William Smith. I'm a uh, fractional CTO based here in Chicago. Um, past life experience, um, used to work at Deloitte, Microsoft, um, all the big companies and helping them with their IT issues. And recently I started doing more um, technical consulting uh, independently. And uh, CT CTO fractional has been something I'm kind of interested in. So I specialize mostly within the cloud. So not necessarily if your computer breaks, but if your cloud, I guess, breaks. Um, it's always fun trying to tell what I do because I sometimes I don't you know what I do. But uh, <laughs> I... Uh, Needless to say, if there's any issues when it comes to um, gaining the value of AI, cloud, um, saving costs on your Azure, AWS spend, that's kind of my, my, my forte. All right, so let's get into the fun stuff. So 
How many people at a show of hands know what a fractional leader is? Okay, everybody here knows what a fractional leader is. Okay, great. So, um, great, great question, right? So, you know, just going over kind of the benefits of it, right? So, generally speaking, um, this is good for startups, generally like 1871 startups or early stage growing companies um, that utilize strategic guidance, but may can't really afford a full-time person, right? So generally speaking, a traditional versus a fractional, you're looking at about, for a traditional, 100,000 to 300,000, so that's like a nice Ferrari, Lamborghini price per year. Versus a fractional executive, which is about 150, 400 and for hourly. And then you have other models like monthly retainer, time commitment, and, and annual cost, which comes out to be in about a Toyota Prius. Maybe not the new one, because the new one just came out. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of nice. Um, during this time, or going to that, you're looking at about 20 to 50 percent less than, you know, what you would get, generally speaking. So hopefully today we'll get a good insight as to if this is a good time for you guys to invest into fractional leadership. So going into the first part of this, um, what makes a good fractional? I'll leave it open. Anybody, shoot. Um, well, from my perspective in, in human resources, what makes a good fractional is someone that's had a lot of different experiences. Um, HR is not just about compliance and operations, but it's really about have you worked with businesses on advising on talent strategy? Um, and have you worked public, private, big, small? Um, the reason that's important from an HR perspective is talent, you know, talent strategy changes as the economy changes, as products change, as people grow into new careers. And having, the, um, having a, a background of seeing things done differently in multiple ways is going to be an advantage for you. And so I... I say, if you're looking for somebody fractional, at least in the talent space, see that they've worked at a lot of different places and held roles, big and small, with and even in a variety of industries. It's going to make them sharper. I can add. The, I can add the product perspective and go to market. So, from a product perspective, I think a good fractional needs to be a quick learner, an adapter, because you really need to know what your company company goals are because that needs to align with the product goals and that impacts the go-to-market strategy and how you're going to be pitching for your product in the market. Um, someone that can really come in, understand all the leaders, what they're working on, um, the top level priorities, how the product fits into the market. So really it's adaptability and being able to really learn the industry quickly, as, especially if it's not their expertise. I'll, I'll just add, um, I think the expertise thing is uh, spot on. I have 83 CFOs on the CFO side of my business. Most of them are at the tail end of their career. Uh, they no longer want to work full time for either a large, medium, or small company, and they want to move to a part-time status, and their resumes are stellar. And so to have a, a fractional CFO on my team that has had a uh, entire career of experience, to be able to slot them with a 10 hour per week assignment is a win, win, win all around. Uh, so that's, uh, that's another like uh, huge benefit of um, fractional. I'm sensing a theme <laughs> because on the legal side, really, I mean, what you all are concerned about is low legal costs. And if we're working by the hour, you wanna know that if you come to us with a problem, we've seen it before, we have a template, we can produce it, and we can have it to you by the end of the day. And that's really what um, we at Founders try to focus on. We have lawyers that come from a lot of different backgrounds. We also have new associates, and we try to balance that because an associate's $200 an hour, and I'm closer to $400 an hour. And so we try to find the lowest common denominator that if it's something that is truly just a templatized document, kick it down to the lowest. Um, if it's something more specialized, then we at the top end. And these are the types of strategy strategies that we try to um, bring to founders to make sure that we keep that cost and build down. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. And it brings me to the next one, building trust. You know, we want to work with people that we trust, ultimately. And um, what are just some of the things that you, you guys can do to instill trust in potential clients, founders, um, and, and beyond. 
this one was very hard for me when I first started uh, because I wanted a national company. And I felt like the best way to build trust was doing events like this, meeting people one-on-one, -on -one, going to chamber events. And so I kind of hit my head against the wall when I first started, I'll be honest. Um, and then what I found quickly is that my first few clients were ones right around me that knew me, I re ran into regularly at events or something of that, and, it, and that effect, and then it actually just spawned a different type of strategy. So um, our uh, go-to-market strategy, which I don't know, we'd have to talk afterwards. <laughs> You'll have to consult me on that. But <laughs> our go-to-market strategy is geographic. I have a salesperson in regions now, and that is the, the intent behind that is to build trust within the community in a geographic um, sense, as well as uh, just you know have more interaction with our clients. Um, so yeah, this one was really hard for me when I got started um, because I thought I could do it digitally and there was just too many people online digitally and no one understood what fractional meant five years ago. And so another question that you mentioned digital, right? Like everything is so accessible. How do you find us? Where, where do we live? You know, are we in 1871 yet? Well, that's a question, at least for the legal industry, that's really tough because I find that a lot of founders, the first lawyer they hire is a friend of a family member or it's, hey, do you know of a lawyer? And if it's, uh, you know, an estate planning attorney, of course that attorney inevitably says, oh, I can spin up a, an entity, right? And by the time it comes to that second or third lawyer, you've got two, $3,000 worth of fixes to actually bring everything back into compliance, or you've just got the completely wrong corporate structure, right? We've got IP in one state, we've got a Delaware entity that's just kind of like an empty shell. Um, and so what I focus on with founders, and this kind of goes to the issue of trust as well, is when I bring in someone, I have a conversation and I talk about our structure and I encourage them to have two or three more conversations and I will even refer people out because there is a small community of people that do this type of work in Chicago, a very small community, and it really is about fit. And so word of mouth and coming to places like 1871, asking some friends, that, like you said, is really, at least for us, um, the best way to find the right fit for you. And one final point on that is personality. Work with someone that you really like to work with because in those early stages, especially for something like legal, and I'll let you all speak to the rest of your industries, but um, oftentimes a founder specifically, we're the only person they can speak to confidentially in those moments where they're having founders disputes or they're having problems with um, you know, an investor and they have to save face in that capacity um, and seem like they are confident and know what they're doing. And so work with someone you feel that you can be vulnerable with and you can ask those tough questions. I'll add one more thing. So when you actually do hire a fractional person, something that I've done is set smaller goals and show went smaller wins. So that's a good way to build trust within the organization and then also connect with other departments and introduce yourself that, hey, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fractional professional for, for your project. These are the wins that I've completed now. So I think initially when you do end up getting a client and it's good to show smaller wins and show immediate results. So pivoting off a little bit on that, um, Branding, right? Associating yourself as a leader in this specific um, field. How do you guys manage personal brand and market yourself as a fractional leader? Tough questions. Definitely tough questions. So something that's worked for me is um, publishing my experience, my previous experience, um, asking for reviews with previous clients that I've worked with, demoing that on my LinkedIn, um, collaborating with other leaders as well. And then that's a good way to s test out, like, is this a good person to work with? And they, they can also test out how well you work. Um, so collaboration is key um, when you're trying to partner and then also build a brand. Um, and then also always demo your expertise on LinkedIn or even be part of industry events. And if you can get engagements like these, those are also a good way to build your brand. And I guess I'll speak a little bit about that too. So um, one thing that's been working for me is just, um, of course, networking your butt off, um, joining personal groups, uh, which I have one here, 
uh, professional groups that work with you uh, to not only help you with your, your pitches, but getting to that finish line, um, but also uh, introducing you to a myriad of other folks. Um, and also building content, right? So if you're on uh, LinkedIn and uh, you're generating things that are towards the problems that you're wishing to solve, people see those problems and say, oh, I need this person. So that, that generally has worked for me in the past. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, next question. <clears throat> what tools or systems do you use to stay organized and manage multiple clients' engagements effectively? How do you, how do you, how do you stay on people's top of mind? My go-to for CRM is HubSpot. Yes. It's not cheap. It, they do have a starter package if you haven't um, you know, built out a CRM yet. But I use it for all the sales process. I use it for client management. I use it for support tickets. Our phone number's tied into that. Everything's tied into HubSpot. I have my Slack synced to HubSpot. So when I get a sale, the whole company gets a notification. <laughs> yeah, I use HubSpot, Trello, um, sometimes Notion, uh, the Apple Notes. You know, you just got to use them all. Um, and uh, how do you ensure continued continuity and knowledge transfer when your engagement ends. So you had a very successful engagement. You're about at the end point. Um, how do you keep it going? Or how do you ensure that they um, measured successfully the success you provided to, um, to them? So I think I heard someone say earlier that, um, you know, we would act in addition to, so I think for legal, eventually you will need a GC, that's the bottom line, or a chief legal, right? And we would be a supplement to that. Um, you're always going to have questions that that person either can't tackle or um, my specialty is actually um, in, in areas that are uh, at the forefront of regulation, so AI or blockchain, those types of spaces are so knowledge intense that often GCs on the day-to-day -day of operating a larger business can't really like keep up to speed on it. And so we hope that you come to a place, we, we are encouraging you to come to a place where you can actually bring on or onboard a seat, a chief legal or a GC. But when you get to that, um, we will basically sit down with that person, onboard them, share um, you know, a, a uh, data room with them. Um, and we're very, you, you asked about keeping documentation and continuity. Um, you know, we use all the fun uh, sort of tools to keep everything organized, um, but we really want to make sure that uh, we transfer all of that knowledge so that there's not even a skip of a beat. Please. Oh, um, I was going to suggest that good fractional will recommend tools that will scale with the organization. So from a product perspective, the tools that I've recommended are Product Plan or Asana, um, because they impact, you know, you could be a small company and then they'll scale with you as you grow. And it's a great place to document your product roadmap, your notes, your market research. So make sure you're a fractional professional is recommending tools that will grow with your organization. I mean, and a lot of the work that I do is I change my operating models or I work with owners to create, you know, what is that structure going to look like? Um, you know, part of my role is really to support them through that process, whether it's, you know, writing job descriptions, understanding where the talent is, um, you know, co-creating team structures, things like that. I mean, I feel like my job ends when, when I feel like they can go and do that on their own or they're halfway there. Um, and so, you know, talent issues are tough because a lot of entrepreneurs, they don't want to deal with that. They want to deal with their creation and their, you know, their product. Um, and so I feel like I, I tend to hang around a little bit more <laughs> just because there's a capability that I can bring and offload some of that so they can focus on their creative endeavors. You reminded me of something that, um, you know, I think a good fractional leader, and at least for the legal industry, is someone who will also work with the other fractional leaders. Um, I, what made me think of this was talking about HR. So when I onboard a client, and it, they're at the very beginning stages, I actually will spend some time with them non-billable going through how to keep a data room, for example. Because in the beginning stages, when you've got 10 contracts or you've got 10 documents, it's really not a big deal. But when you are at a Series A, and now you've got to actually open up a data 
a room for investors and you don't know where anything is, that's a huge problem. We obviously, of course, keep it in-house, but this also pertains to employment issues. So if I send over employment documents to my client, I will sit down with them and say, okay, like these are the reasons why these things are important. Keep creating processes early on, making sure that everyone within the company follows those because as you scale, these can be, you know, these discrepancies become larger and larger and these gaps in continuity become legal problems for companies. And so working together with, um, you know, maybe even asking your, your fractional HR and legal person to come together in one meeting and do a, do a training for everybody in the team um, so that we all kind of get on the same page. You guys kind of touched on it a little bit. Um, the next question, uh, what makes, you know, how do you vet some of the talent, right? Because you could say you're an expert of um, X technology, but come to actually you doing the work, you're, you're not performing. So, you know, uh, adding a little bit more to that color, what do you think are some ways that you can um, properly vet and uh, track performance? Well, this is, I just had a conversation about that this morning. Um, you know, ca finding capable people in my space is not hard. So there's a lot of people that have done HR or ran HR. Um, that does not mean that they're good fractional consultants because it's like staffing the emergency room with a bunch of primary care physicians, okay? They're competent, they're very good at what they do, but the context is frightening. Like they, they don't know what, you know. So we are a strange breed. I mean, we are a, a breed, very seasoned people that have done something over, you know, repetitively in their careers, but also can be agile and creative. And we operate in shades of gray. So we know the black and white for the lawyer comes, you know, we understand where our guardrails are, but we can be creative and innovative. And so when you're looking for a fractional um, resource, it's not just capability and competence, it's can they work in the context of startup, which is chaotic, it's fun, it's exhausting, um, every day is new. Some people love, you know, some people live to do that every day and others do not. So find somebody that really can work with you and partner you with the st at the stage that you're at. Opposite from corporate, right? I'll add, um, I'll add another one. Um, I, it's so funny. No client has ever asked me for references. I, I don't know why in the sales process no one asked for that. I have like testimonials up on my site, but no one has actually asked to talk to another client. I, you should totally ask. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is don't sign up for the year plus engagement. Do a short thing to make sure the personalities are a match. Because like you were saying, the personalities make a huge difference. Uh, and then the other thing that I would add is I find that the ones that when I'm in the sales process um, and if they show up organized, they remembered your last conversation, they evolve that message and said, we can handle X by doing Y and here's a proposal for that. Like they are, um, they're sharp and organized then I find that that would make for a uh, better engagement after you sign on. When you have a willy-nilly scope and, um, and the fractional can't get you to fine-tune that and they don't drive that action for you, I'd pull back. Okay, so going into the specific part, what I'm going to do is um, ask you guys um, specific questions. So. Uh, I got to start with you off again, Erica. So sorry. Uh, actually, maybe. I, mm, actually, you can have a <laughs> okay. No. Fractional HR. There you go. <laughs> That's not the middle. I'm so sorry. Um, How do you approach financial forecasting and rich manage, risk management for startups when you're operating in a fractional capacity? Is that one mine? I think that's your question. That's mine. It's ping, ping pong. All over the that's place. Why. We're just going to ping got pong. It. Yeah, I got the fractional. Uh, I've got the. Um, I've got the financial forecasting. How do you tackle it when what? How do you tackle it 
you made me lose track of where I was That's at. That's okay. How do you approach financial forecasting and risk management for startups when you're operating at a fractional capacity? Sure. It definitely, um, it certainly depends on a, uh, a business stage as to how much rigor you should put into your financial forecast. If you are readying yourself for a fundraise, that is going to be more intense. Uh, you're going to have kind of some scenario analysis on top of what your projections are. So what happens if the pandemic hits again? What happens if I land that big client? Uh, those are a couple of scenarios that you would want to add on to demonstrate to your investors or potential investors uh, that you have your act together, you know what the baseline is, and you know like what could be um, upside and downside to that. Uh, where I see people really go wrong is they spend way too much time here and they, create, they uh, seek precision. Uh, you don't need precision for an investor. You don't need precision for your multi-year forecast. Um, you don't need a precision for a bank loan. You, a financial forecast is an estimate of, a, it should never even have cents on it. Uh, and in so many ways, as you're first getting started. So I, I find that a lot of people get stuck in precision um, and they, uh, they overdo the forecast by saying, hey, I'm going to get this other client and they've got like five other revenue streams and we're going to bake that in. No, the simpler the better. Fewer categories and everything. I actually, um, I did a, uh, I did a uh, webinar with you guys like a year and a half ago or two years ago, where uh, where we basically went through a basic forecast, and I had everybody in a workshop with me, uh, and we were able to complete a forecast in an hour. So on Excel, like or Google Sheets, whatever the tool of the day was. So it is. Um, it, I wouldn't put tons of weight on it. Now, managing to that is where a lot of businesses fail. Uh, so it, it, it tends to be when you don't have somebody with financial um, background on the team, uh, you tend not to look at the numbers on a regular basis because you're worried about your other things going on, which is perfectly fair. Uh, but creating a discipline around a monthly business review, even if you're in just spend mode and you have no revenue coming in yet, Having a monthly business review starts to create the discipline, and then you add your KPIs to that on your sales performance, on your, you know, your delivery of the projects that you are getting off the ground, uh, and um, and any other kind of key KPIs for your business. Uh, just that discipline is uh, is what I would recommend. The first thing. Do you need employees to hire a fractional HR? That would be my question. <laughs> <laughs> No, you don't. If you think you're going to hire employees, um, hire fractional HR. Because HR is not just about paying and the process part, but it's also about what is what are you building? What's your the, where's the talent? What's the talent that you need today? You know, does it reside in your geography? What what's compelling about what you're doing to bring in some key people early on? A, ta a talent, I mean, re that's recruiting, but it's also talent strategy to understand what is the value proposition around what you're doing and what kind of talent you need to get to the next level. So I would suggest, and this this is, again, not full-time work. It's, it's working with, you know, what do you want to accomplish? What do you need? Where are your gaps, you know, in your current, if it's your two or three folks working on this and you don't have capability, you know, where are your missing capabilities? Somebody like a fractional HR person can help you identify that and then go and seek and find those people. So you don't need employees first. How do you understand what the product goals are? That would be mine. <laughs> um, so to understand the product goals, I think it's really important to know the company goals, what the values are, what the missions are, what the vision is and how your product fits into that organization. Um, as you are creating the product roadmap, it's also really important to understand how the customer is going to use a product, um, what the product goals are, what's the benefit that they're looking to achieve from the product, and tie that in with the company's goals and visions. Um, something that I've done in the past is formulate a North Star metric which not only aligns with the product goals, but also the organization goals, and how can each department, sales, marketing, products, um, customer success, add to the North Star metric, and then tie that in 
with the company and then that's how you create your roadmap. At what stage a startup growth does bringing a fractional CTO provide the most value and why? <laughs> um, the simplest answer is when you can afford it. So honestly, having a fractional leader is good. Uh, during the very early stages, like when you're just building a product out, it's, it's good to have a, a full-time person, you know, someone who can maybe work for equity so you save costs, but if you are at a point where you can afford a fractional leader and you don't necessarily have a cutting edge technical leader, um, it's good, because it's always good to have a outside opinion. You know, someone who's have a diverse knowledge or can provide their expertise in a specific area or whatever. So um, yeah, when you can afford it and you're, you're, you're ready to take off, hire a fractional CTO. All right, next question. I'm I'm stop joking. Um, this is the this is a my comedy skit. This is actually not a panel, so <laughs> I'm actually doing comedy. Um, how do you balance the need for comprehensive legal outs oversight with the time constraints of a fractional role? So that's a probably the question with attorneys. I mean, in some in some form or fashion, if you're hiring outside counsel, they are a fractional attorney, a fractional GC. Um, and so you have, I, a lot of my clients have um, sort of an aversion of like, oh, if I call a lawyer, it's gonna be $300. Um, so what we do is um, we actually give six minutes for free um, during the entirety of our relationship. Um, and what that does is it sort of, I talk with my clients early on to say, look, if you can fit that question into six minutes, it's a freebie. So it really, um, I work closely because that helps focus what the question is. What is it that you're really asking me? Um, and a lot of um, that early work of building that trust, building that relationship, um, and being open and honest with your lawyer, um, we can't help you if you don't share what's really happening. So sometimes, um, you know, I have uh, clients who will reach out and they'll say, oh, I need a contract for X, right? Some lawyers will draft the contract and send it over. What I'll do is I'll stop and I'll actually ask, can you tell me a little bit of context? Can you tell me what you need this for, or what issue arose? And sometimes, most times, I actually find that they don't actually need this contract. They need something completely different. Um, but it takes a little bit of like building of that trust and relationship to get to that point. Um, that being said, uh, depending on the industry that you're in, you're going to have to spend the money on um, compliance. Legal is the most important part, and what happens is companies, they have a great idea, they kind of come to a place where all of a sudden they are talking to real investors for real money, and then a huge issue comes up. Either it's a large amount of debt equity that's on your cap table, or an employee who is now soured and left the organization, and he has taken his IP with him, and you don't have an EIACA. Like, these are the things that will tank a really great business at a late stage, and it's really devastating when that happens. And so as much as you don't want to spend the money on legal, if you build a good relationship with an attorney, especially someone who specializes in the startup attorney uh, startup field, um, we will work with you. Um, sometimes if, if a client is on the cusp of closing a round, we will defer those legal costs until that, that round is closed, but we can't do that for you if you don't communicate with us. Quick sound check, or time check, how much time we have, because I did want to save, uh, is, is that five? My glasses. Um, let's say it's a fun one. So can you describe a good experience with a client and a bad experience with a client? We'll start with you, Erica. Well, I will uh, start with the bad one. Um, one of the first clients that I onboarded when I started at Founders, um, and it wasn't bad, it was more just uh, a sort of an eye-opening experience, was that you have uh, a client who comes in and says, you know, I want to do, the, I, I don't know if I should be an LLC or a C Corp. So I sit down with them, we go through the, you know, the questions. Um, I spend probably an hour with them and I can tell on that call that they're doing 12 other things. And um, so I followed up afterwards and I sent an email and I said, hey, this, these are the considerations, just an overview of what we talked about. And um, the next week, the other founder called me and said, what is this email? 
And I was like, oh, so your other founder said that you are considering this conversion. Um, and so this is what we've talked about. And they didn't commute with one, one another. And when they called me, they weren't really listening. And I felt really bad because here I was, uh, you know, a month in, and they had racked up about $2,700 because I kept having to explain the same thing over and over again. And at the end of it, they didn't make a decision and they were upset about the bill. And so I think that was more of a realization of like, you know, I can, I can be there for you, but if you're going to have a fractional leader, time is money. And you need to maximize that money because if you keep coming back and it's for reasons that your, your attention is elsewhere or you're not really listening, you're going to run out of money. And money is a very scarce, a scarce uh, resource at the moment particularly. Um, and then a great experience. Um, a couple of months ago, I had one of my clients who came in for a board meeting, and it was their first board meeting, and we're all sitting around the table, and uh, the CEO is looking around at all of us and said, okay, how do we start? And I, I was like, it's your meeting. And he had this moment of realization, and it was probably the best moment I've had in um, my startup career so far, um, where I watched him turn into a CEO because he stood up and the first time in our four month relationship that we'd been working together, he actually like embodied that with the four other people in that room. And our working relationship has never been the same since. He truly has embodied that and it was really wonderful. All right, I'll start with my bad since you started the trend. I, <laughs> I had a client that signed on uh, for a 30 hour per week CFO. That's not cheap. And they had, they thought they were closing their round, um, and they didn't. It got pushed out another five weeks, but I had already retained the CFO, and they were upset with the bill. And of course, I discounted it. But at the end of the day, like, that was a tough situation on both sides because our CFO wanted to work. They were excited to work for this company. Uh, and then they didn't kick into gear until later, but we just had problems with that bill. Um, so that is, that's another thing too, is have everyone at the ready and the right step in the sales process. If uh, you think money's coming, that's going to enable you to get a fractional, uh, but don't sign the paper until it's in the bank. So uh, that, that happened. It just felt bad all around. Um, and then a good experience happened when I had uh, a client that wanted to retire and um, and I had, in the same industry, another client who was looking to acquire, and we were able to pair them up and, uh, and do the acquisition uh, without broker fees in the mix, which was awesome. Uh, so that one really felt good because we were able to pair, um, and he was able to retire. A lot of good experience. Um, so I think the best experience is when your, your client really values having a fractional leadership. Um, I had a client that was super engaging and they provided all the right resources. Um, they were always on time to all meetings. And I think with when you when you have this communication back and forth, you're losing time. And with when you're growing and scaling, like time is money as, as it's been mentioned. So working with the client that I have there in the ed tech space, they are very open with uh, introducing me to their teams. Um, allowing me to see all the research that they've completely done, which helps me and gets me excited. So engaging me with multiple teams and also being really excited about their product, which is like, it excites me to be a fractional leader for them. I'm last, so I'm gonna do this really quickly. Um, <clears throat> so bad experience, really more for me than the client, was also an engagement, which was like 30 hours a week. And they weren't necessarily taking they weren't invested in it. It was kind of like, I could feel like somebody's making me do this, so I'm gonna do this with you, and we're just gonna keep doing this until somebody tells me to stop, you know? Um, and so that's not fulfilling and um, for a fractional consultant, because we're not staff augmentation necessarily. We're trying to help you get creative or look at things differently. Um, so I just caution fractional, like make sure that there is, you know, why are they, ask good questions. Why are you doing this? Who is, you know, what's your, is there resistance around this? Um, so you can kind of go in understanding how you're going to add value. And then a good experience is I'm actually working with um, a CIO 
leader now, and um, I'm serving two roles so as a fractional or interim uh, leader for his organization, but I'm also changing the operating model. And we've been doing this for three months, and I think the part that makes me smile and keep coming back, even though I have to drive 45 minutes to this client, that's another, another thing, um, is that you can see that no one sat, sat down with him and asked him these questions. And he feels like, oh my gosh, I can be, like, when he responds to me, like, well, that's not how we do it here. And I'm like, well, I don't care. Like, I don't know how you do it here, you know, and I don't really care because we're going to come up with something different, you know. And so pushing him in a creative way and getting him to embrace the process has been really great for me. I hope it's great for him too, but it's been a lot of fun. And he and now he's coming back to me with like really great ideas. I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to be like outsourced in about a minute here because I think I created a really great fractional consultant. <laughs> yeah, I think we all can agree, right? Like not getting paid sucks. So I think that's mine. Like I, I did work for three weeks and uh, the guy ghosted me. So that's always fun. Um, Wanted to save some time for some Q&A, possibly, if we got time, if not. All right, I'm about to get kicked out. Any questions from anybody? No one? Wow, no one? Not a single question? Wow. All right. Hi, um, my name is J.D. Rindak. I actually am a fractional talent acquisition person as well, executive recruiter. Um, I think what might also be helpful, you had just mentioned being interim. So I think just a clarity between the difference between fractional, interim, staff aug, part-time, right? Like all of these terms get used a lot. So I think definition and like when, when each one is most helpful at various stages. Um, and then I'd also love to just understand what made you make that decision to go fractional versus being either in-house or within a larger firm. Um, well, I'm still learning. So I'll tell you, like, I've been doing this for two and a half years, and I think I, do a, like, I started doing a little staff augmentation. I am now in an interim role. What that means is I'm filling a role that there is no headcount for, the individual retired. Um, the organization took this as an opportunity to keep, you know, use me as somebody that'll keep the, the things going, but also use my consulting experience to redesign the, to redesign the function. So I'm kind of doing both. Um, as I evolve as a fractional professional, I, I realize that I really like the consulting project where like knowing, like on a statement of work, versus being staff augmentation or kind of just at the ready for somebody 30 hours a week. But everyone's different. Um, I like project work because for me, it's like, this is what I'm going to do for you. This is how long it's going to take. These are my deliverables. Um, and I've done that with a, with a client where I started doing something really small. And we're like three projects. And now all of a sudden, I'm doing something completely different. So um, I like that. but. I always say for those who are getting into this, you know, because you have to make money. I mean, I'm not independent. My last name is Kennedy, but I'm not related. Um, do what you can do to keep you busy um, and constantly evolve your services. And if you do something that you don't like, guess what? That's not one of the things that you're going to offer. You know, like now you figured it out. So. Um, I am very open, like flexible about that because I think you have to figure out where you serve the client best and be nimble. I think I'd pretty much agree with you. Um, to me, fractional is fairly new. I'm only about two years in and I've done project based. I've done where I'm providing advices on a monthly basis or retainer basis. And, and I kind of agree with you, like I do like project work better because then I have like goals versus like coming in at a specific hours and advising on X, Y, Z. So yeah, it's almost like figuring out as you go. Um, and I'll add to like why I chose fractional. Um, I like 
the variety that comes with it. And I like the fact that I can pick the projects and the types of industries I want to work with, which is different from consulting work because I've been a consultant in the past. And pretty much every client that you go to will offer that cookie cutter like project team set up. But as a fractional, it's very tangible. I know exactly where I come in, I know where I make the impact, and then I leave. And I could get to dabble into so many industries, right? I can, I specifically like mission-driven industries, so I, and I get to do that as a fractional. I would add that, <clears throat> thank you for asking that question. Um, for legal, it's actually a really, really important one because a general counsel is a very specific uh, fiduciary role within an organization. And so when you're ready to have a startup attorney transition to an outside GC, you actually have to have a conversation and there needs to be a separate engagement that kind of goes along with that. Um, and that person will then start to take on other responsibilities within the organization. And they will be somewhat as a staff augmentation in a sense, because if anything arises or risk management um, protocols, all of that will be created by um, the, the fractional GC. Um, the second part of your question, it's, it's a little tied to the first actually because um, for, for fractional legal, especially at the forefront of tech industries, I personally think you need to be working on a number of different projects to be able to build a lot of the regulatory sort of uh, framework for companies, um, you need to pull from other industries. So for example, when I work with my AI clients, I often pull from my blockchain um, experience uh, to allow me to build, an, I hate this phrase, but it's the most appropriate, to build the plane while it's in the air. Because that's what you're really doing as an attorney at these very like highly regulated, um, questionable regulatory ecosystems where you're working. And the ability to have the variety of uh, working with many clients, uh, many investors, I also get to advise in a really, uh, in a real way, um, saying what, you know, what does the ecosystem look like right now? Oh, well, I actually have fund, you know, fund clients and here's what they're telling me, right? So we can actually, I think, better service clients in a fractional capacity. Let's give a round of applause for our panelists.